and we should be live. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in to Volume 7 of the Metal Melting Pot. Tonight's show is going to be quite different than what we've done in the past. There's going to be very little in the way of humor going on here this evening. Tonight, we are here to honor a man, a member of the metal community, who one year ago today was pronounced dead at age 31. A man who wrote and recorded an album with his band released earlier this year, which has resonated with all of us here tonight in a deep and personal way. The man we are talking about is Mr. David Gold of the Ontario-based melodic doom metal band Woods of Ypres. This evening is dedicated to David, his family, and friends, and of course, to the band Woods of Ypres for the music they played, the music they wrote, and the music they would have. Although David Gold was clearly a poet, there is no denying the painful honesty that resided in his lyrics. I know that David Gold probably would not have wanted to be honored and deified in this way after his death, but the words and music found on the band's latest opus, Woods 5, Grey Skies and Electric Light, are far too powerful are far too powerful not to be talked about. So tonight is not only a tribute to the man behind the music, but the music itself. So let us get started. And to those watching along with us, please feel free to voice your thoughts and comments as the night goes on. Thanks. Very well done, sir. Very, very well done. Phenomenal. And the album. Boom. Mine's light as fuck, but there it is. <laughs> Woods 5. I got the biggest one. Sean, fuck you. I want that so bad. Well. So, let's, let's begin. Let's start. Let's uh, talk a little bit about his... Uh, Previous work before we get to Woods 5, I think we should kind of go and talk about what's led up to this. I mean, to the most we can. I know some people have a, you know, I'm pretty sure Duncan hasn't heard the previous albums, but I think we should kind of touch on them quickly. Yeah, because it definitely seems like the band was leading up to the release of this in a very big way, even though they might not have probably known about it at the time. When you listen to the first album, this is the last thing you'd expect them to do because it was such a raw black metal album. It was exactly it, it was. was a ferocious piece of black metal. It was very barren. Yeah, and I really like the evolution that he took from that one to the second one. And yeah, especially the third one, which was the second album, but with more refined sound, and obviously it wasn't as crunched on time during the recording. At least as it sounds. Um, personally, I think the music was near perfect atmospheric black metal, especially the third record. Mm. It is one of my favorites next to this one. Next to Woods 5. Yeah. And the Woods 4, the Green Album, was definitely like the huge step that uh, led them to this new musical sound that they have. I have gone back and listened to Woods 4, and I don't like it as much as Woods 5, but it's still pretty incredible, and it was definitely a precursor <laughs> to Woods 5, at least the yeah, sound like, that they would, mm -hmm. you know. Personally, the way I would put it is Woods 4. Um, that's where the band decided to take the jump, How with, but with Woods 5, they stuck the landing. That's my way of yeah. saying it. Yeah. I actually discovered them... Uh, Actually, last year when I downloaded this free uh, March Metal Madness compilation, it had like a bunch of them. Like, I think Deicide when the plague was on it. Then I saw them on it. I was like, oh. And then I saw—I don't remember what song it was, but what it what like when I heard the song, I thought it was pretty damn good. Yeah, I was actually introduced. Oh, sorry. I discovered them through um, actually Metal Archives and the recommendations because. I posted in there like, hey, I'm looking for more uh, Agawak style black metal. And so I was like, check out Woods Ypres. And I'm glad that person suggested it to me because mm. yeah. I was obsessed with the third record for quite a while. Yeah. Uh, I got introduced to Woods of Ypres uh, several years ago uh, from a bunny of mine in college. Um, I think at that point they were only up to album three. So this was before even uh, the Green Album came out, and I remember really digging it. And um, it's kind of a lot to take in since it was like three albums of material all at once. But I knew that was definitely a band that I was going to be looking forward to, like with each and every new release. And it's certainly been the case since first finding out about them. Very glad that my friend uh, showed me. For me, sadly, I didn't find out about Woods until 
the death of David Gold as I did uh, the weekly, you know, news show, A Moment of Metal, and I had to report on, you know, David Gold's sadly passing. I had never heard of Wood. I had never heard of Woods before, but when that happened, I did finally check it out. And then, of course, you know, Woods Five came out mm-hmm. not too long afterwards, and I pretty much fell in love with this record. So, yeah. my yeah, person took the death of him to make me hear them, but at least I was exposed to them. Even yeah. though it was in a very, you know, terrible way. Yeah. My first introduction to Woods... Okay, never mind. You, you go first. <laughs> go on, go on. Okay. Alright, fine. <laughs> um, my first exposure was Woods for the Green Album. That was definitely my first exposure because I was actually looking up a lot of local Canadian metal bands at the time, and I came across this one completely by accident. It was just in the uh, related videos in the description box. And it, the song was uh, Wet Leather. Mm. And from then on, I was just hooked. And then I went back and I listened to um, Pursuit of the Sun and the Lure of the Earth. And then from there, I went to Woods 3. And that was my first introduction. I was just hooked. Um, I think we forgot to uh, introduce Luke Hammerheart to this. Yes, Mr. Luke Hammerheart, for those who don't know, is joining us. The guy I was rude enough to just cut off. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. I'm new here. I don't really know what to expect, so I'm a little bit nervous, like I could say. I'm not ashamed to admit it. There's no need to be nervous, sir. (laughs) But uh, I'll tell you my my first exposure with Woods, and uh, it was with the Sun and Allure of the Earth. And the title song, uh, one of my friends posted it on my Facebook page, and he wasn't the kind of guy that I expected to post something like that. So I was, like, interested in it, and he was telling me a bit about the band and stuff and how they were Canadian, so I was like, all right. So I listened to the song, and uh, immediately it was just, like, I listened to it once, and I listened to it again and again and again, and then I got the album uh, a couple weeks later, and uh, I listened to it just nonstop for a really long time. And that was only, like, a year and a half, maybe two years ago. It was almost just before uh, David passed away. And then uh, the beginning of this year, I saw that they had another album out, so I went and picked it up, and just instant classic, just, you know, it's a fabulous album. Mm -hmm. Mm. Speaking of which, that's a good idea. (laughs) Oh, and by the way, I like your Ziltoid puppet behind the CD. Thank you. Um, For me, when I heard what's five, it was actually the day, I believe it was the day, over the the day after David passed away, uh, Earache Records put the promo out for a free download. Yeah, I had that as well, actually. I I had, had, like, a different track listing, and it split Kiss My Ashes Goodbye into, like, two parts. Yeah, no. I had that. I think it was Keeper of the Ledger, was it on there? Yeah. No, it wasn't on there. I remember downloading that, and I waited, like, all day to listen to it. I forgot why I was gone, but I came home, and I turned the lights off in my room, and hold up the lyrics because they were all posted on Metal Archives because Eric also is, you know, lyrics were. And I sat there and I listened to the album from beginning to end in one shot while reading the lyrics. Mm-hmm. And that was one of the most, like, the hardest hitting experience I've ever had musically. Like, yeah, the emotion. album is pretty absolutely. heart-wrenching at times. It was I agree, that's the same thing that happened with me. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the lyrics because the very first time I listened to this album was with the lyrics up on screen and... This is one of the first albums I have ever encountered where the lyrics are, I think, the most important part of the album, Absolutely. and the and, and the part of the music that yes. stood out the most they upon first the, listen. The lyrics definitely have the most impact, I think. Yeah. The music That's is phenomenal, sure. of course, but the lyrics are really what leave you with you know it really impacts you and it really leaves you with uh, the whole essence of the album, I guess. Yeah. After you're done listening to it. Yeah, I mean, I can't think of any other album that I've listened to, that at the end of it, I said, wow, those lyrics were amazing. Yeah. Just, uh, There's never been really a record I ever listened to where the first thing I did was I pulled the lyrics. So. Yeah. Usually uh, albums take a little bit of time to learn the lyrics, or sometimes if it's a metal record, you can't really dis- uh, distinguish what the lyrics are. You, you go back to the lyric booklet after you've heard it the first time and stuff like that, but this was all right away. And not only are these lyrics like, really deep and meaningful, very meaningful, mm-hmm. they're catchy and they're very easy to remember, which is, yeah. you know, lends the hand to the, you know, how much the how much the record is going to 
impact you. Yeah, it's a very quotable, very memorable album. Very memorable, yeah. You know, the thing is also with the lyrics to that, and this is a discussion I've had with a few different people, uh, some people were too fond of David's style of being straight up blunt with his emotions and feelings. Mm. Because yeah. he didn't sugarcoat it, he didn't use big words to express his ideas or whatever, it was just kind of like what came out of his head was what he put down on paper. And to me, yeah. that is way more genuine and sincere. Agreed. Yeah. Exactly. Not to, me not to mention, all of the choruses have very large variations from oh, yeah. from uh, yeah. each time that they appear in the song, and that just proves how much effort gets put in because it's, there's just not simple lines that repeat. They have yeah. vast amount of variation in each. Yeah, there's one. people that were saying, "Oh, the lyrics are simplistic. I don't see the big deal." I'm like, "That's the beauty of it. Is it's simplistic because." It really conveys the whole idea yeah. of music. His emotions, it feels genuine. Not forced like some bands that do that. Yeah. Um, I feel like it made it way more uh, hard-hitting. Yeah. And the idea that... Um, well, people have kind of pondered of whether this was like a suicide note or... A, just sort of like a precursor to his death, but the tour was already planned. He had already had the lyrics for the, the next few albums already planned out, so this wasn't exactly something that was planned, but the the creepiness yeah. that that um, creates, knowing that he did die before the release of this, is just... There, there are no words to describe that. It's but, scary, uh, to say the least, and it's definitely... But, um, definitely I liked how John described it in his review of it that it almost looks like diary entries. Yeah, but um, it is true. They, they they do look like diary entries, but they also look like little stories as well. Mm -hmm. I can't help but feel like he almost knew he was gonna mm -hmm. die because like I asked for a second chance and life said no. Yeah, when exactly. When I read that line, I had chills. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and for That's me, like this so was like. Or I kiss my ashes goodbye. Uh, even oh. alternate ending with a uh, how he talks about being in the car. Yep. It's almost moment. as if he knew exactly where and when he was gonna die. Yeah. yeah. And how, like what what it's he was gonna be thinking like, about, and where he's gonna be, and just stuff. <laughs> in a way, it's almost like um, when they say when you're about to die, when your life flashes before your eyes. It was kind of like that. Except yeah. he was able to put that into music before it would actually happen. Maybe not consciously, but subconsciously. It's such a mystery surrounding this album in terms of its eeriness. Yeah. Of course, we'll never know for sure, but to me, yeah. it just doesn't seem like it was a, a deliberate suicide note. Yeah. I no. think it's unfortunate that, like, you know, had, had he lived. The album was released. It would still be just as hard hitting, but it, it sort of hits you in a different way, knowing that he did die. Exactly. And, mm -hmm. and thinking about how it happened, it's almost like a foreshadowing. And I think the fact that he that he did pass away just sort of adds a little bit something like something different to the album, as morbid as that might sound. But I mean, it just hits you in a different way. Yeah. Even if he was alive, like I said, it'd still be a fantastic album. Oh, absolutely. But it definitely changes how you look at the album and how you listen to it. Yeah. Because yeah. now that you have that context in mind, it makes it just that much harder. Completely really different mindset, yeah. yeah. Hold on. Uh, I must say, though, the one thing I really do um, All right. appreciate about the music behind it, it itself, like not just the lyrics, but the music. The music was catchy, but different. Like, especially for like doom metal, this more depressive rock sound. This, some of the music was actually quite lovely. In it. Mm -hmm. and these lyrics added a really good contrast to it, and I really enjoy that factor about the album because it has that sort of element to it. Exactly, and that's the style that they were really sort of developing on Woods Four as well. Yeah, yeah, and so lyrically, that's their sort of weird motif that they had. Yeah, and the lyrically, work. the doom and gloom aspect and talking about death isn't exactly a new idea either. Yeah, because it almost seems like he portrayed his life as a as a story almost within this band because of the the songs like uh, I was buried at Mount Pleasant Cemetery like obviously he didn't die after writing that song and he yeah. already said that he was like basically dead at that point or he 
he could have been talking about some other mysterious character that wasn't him, but he did think it's play too. a dead person in that video, so... The thing well, is, too, with uh, David Gold's lyrics, is the pain that he expressed in his music felt so genuine, not only in his lyrics, but in his vocal performance. Right. On how he sang it, you could feel the emotion. And that's one thing about the song, uh, You Are Here With Me in the Sequence of Dreams off of Woods 4. Absolutely. It's that's a beautiful so song. Amazing. Yes. But uh, you can hear, like, the sadness in that song. You can hear the sadness in a lot of the songs. And it's Same with, like, shards of love. Lyrics, but it's another way to convey them. It's completely different to convey them in a genuine fashion. And yeah. he nailed that. Yeah, I mean, for someone who, not to put him down or anything, someone who doesn't really have a lot of, like, range or sort of, like, vocal finesse to his yeah. styles, I think his um, his genuineness lies in the way that he's able to just make the timbre of his voice speak the emotions. And yeah. you're able to feel it in how yeah. his voice is uh, projecting the words, the, you know, everything. It's like, It just paints a picture more than just, like, singing all these like high notes and, and stuff like that. It, that even though it, like, it sounds like he's almost speaking to you sometimes, but it's still yeah. hitting you just as hard. Absolutely. He doesn't really he doesn't really have to add that much finesse yeah. because you can still you can still feel it and you can still hear it. Yeah. That's for sure. A good example of that is in the song Silver. Mm. Oh my god. I just That's one of the best that. examples of it. Like he's not doing anything particularly huge or impressive, but the way his voice sounds, it just sounds like painful to hear yeah. him singing these big, lyrics. Big part of that is actually the melodies too. Like especially in the ending when he goes, uh, "When did the city make you so cold?" Yes, that part mm -hmm. agree. You can really hear like the melody added to that emotion, and also the fact that he doubled his voice up a lot on the yeah. record. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. And that's normally I'm not a big fan of extremely layered vocals, but he did it right. So well, they have this haunting natural. tone. Yeah. Dude, his voice on this record gave me chills all the way through the album. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, the thing with David Gold's voice is it's like it wasn't even just like, oh, we're gonna put vocals over this, oh, we're gonna write some meaningful lyrics over it. It was like David utilized his voice as literally another instrument to convey mm -hmm. emotion yeah. directly yeah. to the music. Without even having to go too overboard with it. Exactly. Yeah. He keeps it very minimalist, but yet it's so impactful, even more impactful than most people who try to you know, pour their emotions into the lyrics and into the the vocal melodies and harmonies and all that. And it seems like David just kind of had that down without even needing to uh, be too flashy with it. Yeah. And I like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, it wasn't melodramatic or anything over the top. It was... Nope. Just enough to convey it, nothing more. Sometimes less is more, and Woods is a great example of that. Absolutely. It was pure and to the point and just what it needed to be. Just enough so that it conveyed what he wanted to convey, but yet it wasn't too much to where it felt watered down or there was too much there. Yeah. It was, yeah. Just, it was the perfect amount, literally. Yeah. And even the and even the screams have a big amount of clarity to it. It, yes, it's really not uh, much deciphering you need to do to understand the lyrics, even in the screams. It, it's like almost as if the deliberate clarity was like uh, a way to um, make the, the lyrics more apparent to the listener. Even back in Woods Three Days, I felt like his vocals had a pretty good clarity, especially in black metal. Yeah, because a lot of black metal is just so raspy and yeah. they don't even really pronounce the words properly. Mm -hmm. You can tell he took the time to enunciate everything he said. Yeah, it's almost as if he wants the lyrics to be heard, and it certainly made all the difference in the world. Whatever you know, his intentions were, it it works. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. There was a song that I listened to earlier today that was uh, I'm trying to find it here, but it was uh, a side project that he did. I don't know if some of you might know it, what it was, but uh, the Ontario Black Metal Preservation yeah, Society. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really Ontario. Black Metal. And even that, I, I just heard one song from, I guess they only released one EP or a demo or something. But yeah, it was a seven inch. It was really good. good. Like, there, and even in that, there was clarity. Like, it was black metal, but with, with clean vocals as well, and like all the rafts and everything were still easy to hear, and you could still make it out without having to read the lyrics. Yeah, that, that was something I really liked about that project he had, and I wish 
is still alive, like, not only for the fact, you know, sad that he's gone, but, damn, I would have loved to hear more from that project, because that was some really good stuff. Because, once again, it was... The thing is, with Woods, also, is nothing extraordinarily new was brought to the table with anything they did, mm -hmm. but they did it in such a good way where it didn't matter. And that's the same thing with that black metal project, is that was really, really good black metal. And he managed to do it in a genuine, clean sort of way, not like that a lot. And even the drums in some uh, Korean death metal band, I was watching videos of it on his uh, YouTube channel that he had. And that was impressive stuff, I must say. Absolutely. It's kind of, it's kind of awesome that David also played uh, drums on the on Woods 5. Yeah. I thought yeah. his drumming I thought his drumming was pretty phenomenal on it. Yeah. So I'll get from a drummer. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, yeah, but still, they're it's it's pretty intricate playing, if you ask me. Yeah. It was very uh, Sim it's simplistic but very well executed. Exactly, because in my opinion, like at least from my perspective, it's harder to write slower stuff on drums and keep it interesting than it is to write fast death metal or black metal or whatever on drums. I agree. Because you're going so fast, I agree completely. there's not all this big space in between measures and in the actual measure itself. You manage to actually keep it interesting to listen to, but without going overboard. Yeah, yeah and David did just that. It doesn't get boring. Like, There's nothing on this album that gets boring. Like, yeah, you listen to it over it. and over and it doesn't get annoying, it doesn't get boring, I mean, it'll get stuck, it's been stuck in my head for the entire year, and I just yeah, exactly. it. Yeah. Every day, like, every day I think of some lyrics, I'll, I'll be, like, humming along to a riff or whatever at work, like, whistling, anything, and it doesn't stop. <laughs> and I'm not disappointed about it. Yeah. And also the inclusion of um, the cello and oboe on a lot of these tracks. Yeah. Yeah. He could have used an entire symphony if he wanted to, but he kept it extremely minimalist. And once again, less is more. That's yeah. a great example. Yeah. Another thing I must say, and uh, this is big props to Joel for this, yeah. was the keys on the album. Mm -hmm. And Joel did a great job on everything. I mean, huge props to him for this record. Because, I mean, for this, he wrote songs 2, 4, 6, 7, 10, and 11. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. And uh, the keyboard work, especially on uh, Kiss My Ashes Goodbye, made the part in uh, when the first chorus came in, uh, I guess most people would know it as Kiss My Ashes Goodbye Part 1, when he did the Save Your Tears at the End of Our Time. Mm. When that piano comes in, that makes that part even more hard-hitting. Yeah. And in fact, yeah. it, that was the combination of the lyrics, the vocal performance, and the keyboards just really set me to the point where I was wiping away tears when I heard that the first time. Yeah. And I still, every once in a while when I hear it, it will hit me that hard. And same thing for Finality. Mm -hmm. The finality piano in the beginning of that is yeah. perfect. That's a song um, those last two hard. songs are just so crushing. I just like, listen, I, I'm looking at some of the comments on here, and someone said they met David at uh, Heavy T.O. in 2011. Oh, wow. That's awesome. He said he was a really nice dude. I'm pretty jealous, dude. I'm very <laughs> jealous. I must say, I watched interviews with David, and he seemed like the nicest guy in the world. Always smiling yeah. in the interviews. No matter yeah. how bad the show was or the turnout or whatever, just said, you know, it'd be <clears> nice <throat> if this paid off more, but I'm going to keep doing it because I know one day it will. Exactly. Like, I, I was watching their tour diaries that they had posted on their channel, and... It was so funny. I know. <laughs> like, I remember one scene, they were sitting in a Perkins at 2 in the morning. And, <laughs> and like how David said, well, today's sh last night's show sucked, but today's show was great. And how last night I had this after that shitty show, so tonight I'm going to have a Tangler burger or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and like he was so... Like his music was so emotional and it was really hard-hitting and depressing, yet he was always this upbeat sort of really down-to-earth person, and I respect him a lot for that. I really wish I could have met him. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah, me too. One thing that really disappoints me too is the one thing that really disappoints me is this was the album, without a doubt, that was going to send Woods to the level that David wanted them to be at. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Like, and, I, and I think it did. A major label instead of his own label. Mm-hmm. Um, like, Woods 4 just got reissued on Earache, and mm-hmm. Earache was putting out Woods 5, and they were going to tour Europe for the first time. It's so sad that it happened that way. Yeah. But going back to what uh, John said about him being always happy, uh, his final interview he seemed actually quite depressed. And yeah, Luke the showed me the interview, and uh, hmm. he was talking about after he writes the album and it's about to be released, he goes through a rather like dark time. Yeah. Because uh, I forgot like what the reasons were, but you could tell he was really down. And I guess the editors of the magazine thought uh, it was Terrorizer, I believe. Yeah. They followed up with him to make sure he was all right. But wow. in every interview, though, and all the blogs that he did, just always a happy dude. I don't know that's what I, I thought. Got that was kind of interesting. On YouTube and shit, I was just like, you know, the lyrics in the interview say one thing, and then you know he's a different person in different contexts. It was just sort of a weird eye opener, almost. I mean, it was kind of an odd experience when I'd seen him so happy where beforehand all I had ever known was, you know, depressed David Gold or something like that. Or angry. (laughs) Makes you think the music was sort of like just him purging himself of those feelings. Oh, absolutely. Well, listen to like modern life architecture. The lyrics in that, it's kind of like he's, uh, you know, he's trying to convey, he's like, you know, he's broken down, he's depressed, he's reached his breaking point, but that's just like how he's living and that's his life and he's learned to live with it, I guess. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, once when modern like architecture comes on on this like the album in the order that it is for the release, that's when you're about to hit the, the darkest point of the album. Yeah, it just mm-hmm. takes a completely different turn. Like up to that point it was still very dark in many ways. And but silver I weird. guess you could say was one of the more darker songs on the first half. Right. But I think Career Suicide it was kind of an upbeat one. And then once when Modern Life Architecture comes in, that's when it's about to get. Yeah, like Career Suicide had kind of an almost an uplifting message. Yeah. Too. Like, uh, what's what's the line he says? It's like, um, failure is not the end of the world, that's just society. Yeah. You, know, you got to be content with that kind of thing. But then it comes in modern life architecture, and it's like he lets it all out. Like, yeah, I'm a broken man, and he's, he's <laughs> tumbling down. And I can't remember the lyrics precisely, but mm-hmm. it's something along the lines of that. Yeah, I love the different perspectives that each song takes on this album. Yeah. The different ways of, um, of looking at a life, you know, from the person themselves, to the friends and family, to the way that uh, life portrays life, how the business world portrays life, especially in career suicide, it's not real suicide, and how um, religion views a life. Yeah. It's It's an album that really makes me think. Yeah. And also, like, the value of a life within relationships as well, whether it's, like, a romantic relationship or, like, a a parent and a a son or daughter or something like that. Yeah. You know, that's kind of like in modern life architecture, too. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, and even the idea of, like, death from the other side. Mm-hmm. That's that's a big one as well. Yeah. It even touches on suicide with death is not an exit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It just seems to go on and on and on. It's like, I think he pretty much exhausted all the, the possible uh, ways you can look at life. I like that, like, David Gold literally took us on, like, a, a, a literal roller coaster of emotions. Like, you'll go from the highest points in, like, Career Suicide, which is kind of a happy song, down to, like, Modern Life Architecture, and Death is Not an Exit, and all that. It's like, you will go through every single emotion you can possibly yeah. uh, go I through. I even found Death oh, is and, Not an And even in uh, Kiss My Ashes Goodbye, it's basically, like, how someone thinks of their own life and what should be done with it after it's gone. <laughs> it's yeah. Just, you know, my body, I make my own decisions. <laughs> yeah. And I really like the line where it was, let's say, uh, I'm trying to find it, but no monument for me, please, I'm not one of them. I didn't need it in life, and I won't need it in death. Yeah. It's yeah. kind of like, it's over. What's the point? 
point in having a stone? What's the point in kind of celebrating it? And, and he even touches on that before the album with, uh, throughout the song when he goes, um, the living are here to be adored. Mm-hmm. The dead are to be forgotten. The living are here to be adored. He kind of talks about like once when you're dead, it's over. Just kind of move on. That's what you got to do. Yeah. And it's the note that really makes you think about just everything in life. And that's Agreed. something that I really appreciate about the album. Yep. Uh, I think the the two most um not I'm not gonna say eye opener, but the 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 the, uh, the lyrics to Keeper of the Ledger and um Career Suicide is not real suicide, it's basically like it's about like what your place is in life, whether it's like living on this earth or in the workplace, and yeah. Yeah. that is just something that not too many people think about. It's like in the workplace, it's like you're just a person who carries out a certain activity. If you die, someone else can just take your place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're all expendable. Basically. And it basically, yeah, everyone's expendable. It's like you know, there's so many other people who can do what you do. It doesn't matter. You know, there's there's a lack of sincerity there. And then just the idea of like the keeper of the ledger, it's like if you die you're just another number or another tick on the wall. Yeah. It's just there's no sincerity there. It's like life really doesn't care if you exist or, or not. It's just You're nothing in this grand scheme. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Life yeah, exactly. doesn't care about you, but it's the it's the people on earth that you know that's um, the significant part there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's in that line, uh, we were nothing four billion years before our time and we will be nothing more after that and it's just yeah yes like we're going to be here for a certain period like, of time even though it seems like a long fucking time for us you know millions and millions or billions yeah. of years in the long scheme of things that is nothing that is a speck yeah. on the timeline of you know existence yeah you know? the existence of a, a conscious a conscious rational mind is certainly something that we could have never predicted and it's definitely a gift but the significance of it in, in the total scheme of things isn't exactly, you know, That's, all that big or all that significant. But. You know, we can't even truly comprehend it either. Yeah. In Keeper of the Ledger, one of my favorite lines is, when nature comes collecting, it doesn't care about you. It, when nature comes collecting, it doesn't care at all to what you know. When nature mm-hmm. comes collecting, it doesn't care to hear your story. When nature comes collecting, it only, it wants, only wants you, for, wants your you for your body. Yeah. Like... That's a really powerful line. It's just mm-hmm. it doesn't matter what you've done in life. It, your time's up. Yeah. But and in a way, you can kind of even look at that as it only cares about your body, almost as in mm-hmm. maybe it's because I've listened to some bands like uh, Wolves in the Throne Room with the song "I uh, Lay My Bones Among the Rocks and Roots," when they talk about their body replenishing the earth. Mm-hmm. Being, back into the earth, you know? The idea of recycling. <laughs> yeah. And I kind of see it in that Very way. morbid sense, but... I kind of see it a little bit like that, and I think that's a kind of a another perspective you could take on that line. Yeah. That's one thing about this album. It's like, it's, it's very blunt and honest, but it's also interpretive at other times. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Not too many albums have lyrics that can play on both sides of the fence like that. Yeah, yeah. It's either you have no idea what the lyrics mean, and you just gotta like make them mean whatever to you, or yeah. you can just be overwhelmed with emotion in these lyrics, like uh, like this one. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think lyrically it's fucking awesome. I remember the first time I didn't get to really express my feelings. The first time I listened to it, the lyrics. I bought the album and I listened to it a couple times without the lyrics, but because it is so clear and because I can catch on so easily with it and it's so memorable, I was like, you know what, I have to sit here and I have to read the lyrics, but like the lyric sheet, because that helps me get more into the music, like a little bit easier for me to understand what's going on. And uh, I was laying on my couch and I just sort of, I sat there and I was reading along and it was just sort of like, I was in a different sort of state of mind and all of a sudden the, the album was over and I just sat there and I was just sort of sitting there with, you know, nothing. I was just like, holy shit. And uh, from then on, it's like, it, it was just a different experience. It's an album that will leave you with two different feelings. One, either 
really, really depressed, or the other one is you're thankful to be alive. Yeah. Yeah. And I get that kind of at the same time. I get both feelings. Same it's here. such a dark and depressing album in the context of what happened to David. And uh, well, it's also enlightening, very enlightening. Yeah, well, it makes you it so makes you want to do something and change or something. Like with the lyrics, uh, gotta, I gotta look them up because like, fuck it, I can't think of them right off the top of my head. But, um, oh man. Uh, but anyway, like to protect your body for for it's all we really are. That yeah. whole thing makes me think like you know I gotta I gotta do something better I mean I gotta stay healthy because I don't want to die and mm-hmm. it's like it's true that's all we have to keep us alive it's all we got to keep us going is our own bodies yeah mm-hmm uh, it's such an ironic album too on so many levels like obviously the lyric you know uh, you know what's documented here and the events of what happened is, is a very ironic you know, thing but it also goes much deeper than that knowing that in the lyrics, he said, "You know, you know, praise the living while they're on earth, and look, look what we're doing now." Yeah. This is this yeah, is no, <laughs> this is not what the gonna... lyrics told us to do, but it's yeah, it's, it's, uh, it can't not happen, you know. Exactly. This is one of those really odd occasions where it's like we know what you're saying, but it, it has to be talked about. It was like when I first got it, I was started listening to it, and I loved it so much, I I needed to talk about it. But at the same yeah. time, it's like you know, it's telling me not to. It's telling me not to praise him. I know, and, and like, I just continue to put it into perspective. <laughs> but it's not just because of the lyrics. It's and and what happened. It's because this is just an overly solid album on so many levels. Yeah, I think it would honestly. I would still give it, hold it in the same high regard, even mm-hmm. if he didn't pass away. Yeah, even if he didn't, it would still yeah, be. Yeah. Exactly the same. It just yeah. only adds to the dimensions of how you appreciate this album, knowing that he did die. Uh, so many people does. say, "Oh, you really yeah. like it because he's, he's dead." It's like you know, but it's yeah. it's not that's not the way it is. I mean, he happens to be dead, and I love the album regardless. Yeah. I don't like but, it when people say you yeah. like it because it's gone, and it's just sort of kind of hard to explain otherwise, especially to ignorant people. <laughs> <laughs> and um. There was a important word I think I just said the idea of appreciation, like when it's uh, with songs like Keeper of the Ledger, um, saying that we're just a number on Earth or in career suicide we're all expendable. It's the idea of appreciation and love adds some significance to a life. You know, we we hear about love and relationships in the song Silver and also in the song uh, Finality. It's just you know we didn't get to spend our lives together and I will miss you forever. It's yeah. like the idea of love is just really, really strong within That's, this uh, idea of human nature we have. Yeah, this song, that song really just hits me so hard. Mm-hmm. Especially when he uh, talks about choices mine for a long time that will never come. Though we leave this world apart, I still went peacefully, quietly. With you still firmly in my heart, I will wait forever. <laughs> I will wait. Yeah. That part is just when I start going. Yeah. And then it just gets silent. <laughs> I just start to honestly. Yeah. Uh, the, I start to cry. It's, yeah. yeah it's, I still get the chills and you know watery eyes whenever I hear alternate ending. There's, I think that is the most emotional peak of that album. Yeah. An alternate ending and. Mm. <laughs> and the yeah, whole idea of uh, the whole idea of holding on, at the end is just. That line is repeated just a couple of times. Yeah. yeah. In the end, was there anyone to share your joy? You know, who was there at the end with you? Was there anybody there? Yeah. Holding just, on yeah. to a dream when the end couldn't come slow enough for me. Holding on. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of a crazy line to go out on. I mean, you think, like, that's literally the last thing that you hear on this record, and then, well, Dave Gold sadly passes away, and that's what we're left with, just holding on. Well, yeah. How creepy highway, that is. My final moment, still wondering of you. Final track on the album dies in a car crash. That's yeah. yeah exactly. And I must say, like on a side note about this album, the cover is so perfect. Yeah, I agree. And the cover was made after, right? Like after he was pronounced um, dead. 
No, it wasn't. No, I thought it was. I thought it was finalized before. Yeah, it was, was it? Because if you remember, because I was wondering about this this whole time. Yeah, the promo of it. The only thing that was different about it when he was alive is it didn't have the logo on it. Because I was reading. Oh really? A statement from the label. I guess some magazines are so picky when they do a review, they will negate a score because they can't read the band's logo. So they changed it to say, "Ben just plain text with the e pray." Mm. And also, this alternate one is amazing with the seven-inch vinyl. That you know. That's a sick cover. Yeah. And when another you, another thing about it that's really creepy is that alternate ending comes on that vinyl because it wouldn't uh, on the bonus seven-inch because it wouldn't fit on the the yeah. full length, right? Yep. Alternate ending is side A then. By now, the uh, Siegfried Meyer mix, which is the producer's version of it, which is a little bit different. Like, it features uh, more percussion, but it's basically, the, it's essentially the same song. Yeah, and to me, like, the the vinyl version of that ends with finality, and then, of course, there is that alternate ending on the, um, the 7-inch, but it just makes me wonder, like, you know... There really was an alternate ending here. It's like he could have not died, yeah. or he could have died, yep, and he yeah. did. So yeah. there is that alternate ending here, and you know it's on one of the track listings and not on the other. But then it's on the bonus seven inch. So yeah, because it's just, right here on the back. It's just so odd. <laughs> yeah, on the vinyl finality, it's the last one mm -hmm. listed. And then when you get this, it has it. Yep. Mm. This is so bizarre. That's another way to kind of, in context... It's like, how would they have known? Well, I mean, I suppose they would have known whether it was going to fit or not once they finished the recording process, but... You know. Yeah. This is weird that that was, like, the one song that didn't fit, and then it being, like, titled that way and having the subject make sure that it does. It's just very odd. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> just it, it, all the, it's like all the signs really point that this was, like, you know... Uh, you know, uh, what's the, what's the word I'm looking for? Inevitable. <laughs> it definitely does. Oh yeah. It's like they didn't try to make it that way. Everything just sort of aligns, so it is that way. Yeah, as I said, it's a very natural album. Like things were meant There's, to work out this way. There is nothing about very the record bizarre. forced. Like everything about it comes across as 100% genuine. I find it's, some bands that try to have extremely emotional, impacting lyrics like this. Like sometimes I'm a big My Dying Bride fan. Sometimes mm -hmm. I feel like they try too hard. They're an example of that. Um, Woods really nailed it on a, so many levels, and the fact that it comes across as genuine really makes it that much better for me. It's literally like there are so many bands that will sit down and be like, we want to write a really emotionally driven record. And then they try, and while it is really good, it's just not as good as like something like Woods 5, where it's literally like the whole band sat down in a room, and we're just like, okay, let's start writing. And this is what came out, a very genuine, very emotional album that is just mm -hmm. full of so many different feelings and everything. And It's like, you know, it just came literally so naturally, like you were saying. It's yeah. just like, this is literally what Woods was always meant to be. Dave said, said in a few uh, different interviews that Joel really helped them with the direction that Woods went into. And, I mean, that's a... Mm. That, no one really talks about him with this album because... Yeah, the, the guitar that, solos were just very, very chilling. Dude, the guitar the solo on uh, Kiss My Ashes Goodbye is amazing. Mm. Yeah. That's probably my favorite solo on the entire record, besides Career Suicide. The, uh, the matter is, is, he actually wrote the majority of the songs on the album, too. <clears throat> and the fact that he was able... And this is a part that I find kind of strange, is he was able to actually write the music that fit the lyrics so well, even though it wasn't his emotions, if you know what I mean. That's, that's true. Yeah, it's like they were able to connect on such a deep emotional level that the music was able to connect on that level as well. Yeah. And it's it just kind of, it's like they synced up perfectly, and this is what we got as a result. Absolutely. 
Yeah, I mean, the guitar solo that happens after um, there was a flash of lightning followed by snow, which was just a moment of change before years of sorrow. The shock and awe, the fright and woe, I only had one life to live and life said no. And then the solo happens and yeah. it just blows up. That's one, just, one of my favorite moments on the album. That is, uh, I think that was the moment where I just realized that this this album had a power that had a mind of its own. Just a power that I wasn't able to experience with too many other too many mm -hmm. other records. Especially at, at first listen. Yeah. Yeah, this, uh, screwed up promo version, like with the track listing that they had. Mm -hmm. Like, let me look at it, because I have it on my Zoom. Uh, pretty sure I have this, that version. Yeah. Um, it was actually at that moment when it hit me, because the album started off with uh, Career Suicide, and... I thought that was really good, but it didn't really hit me in any sort of way. Um, then traveling alone hit an alternate ending, and that was when I was starting to feel it. Lightning and snow, and it was the line that you said with that solo that hit me. And then right when finality came on, I was that was like the low point emotionally. Finality is a really beautiful track with the like the piano and the violins and stuff all going on. It's mm -hmm. yeah. just a very emotionally yeah. driven track, and, and even the it's easily one of the highest points on the record for me. Mm -hmm. Like the or even one of the lowest if you look at it from an emotional standpoint. Yeah, like the background vocals too. Like once when the violin comes in, when you hear the oh sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That adds even more power to it. Yeah, I think they definitely hit the nail on the head when they finally packaged this and released it with the updated track listing. You know, yeah. Not to say that it was bad before, but it definitely tells more of a story this way. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I'm just like very grateful that we were able to you know have a physical copy because I know it was sort of up in the air of whether or not they were actually going to be able to release the album in hard copy because, like, you know, the family might not have wanted it, or... Well, I'm so glad they did, though. I uh, really am. I guess uh, there was an interview I was watching with David where he said he posted on his personal Facebook page and he would just kind of add like, what uh, fans had him. And he put up a status because, like, physical copies were going down of their albums. It's like, oh, I was just kind of thinking maybe this, this would be a digital-only album. And then just someone said that, and then just spread it everywhere that it was officially going to be a digital only. Hmm. And he's like, I never said that. <laughs> and uh, I guess they decided to make a physical copy, and very glad they did. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, who said anything about poor record sales? We all bought it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bought this. It was just many many it's an experience you want to be able to, you know. Have even if it, a piece even of, if, even if it was for me yesterday, buying it because I didn't have a chance to. Before. Yeah, I mean, I I picked this up recently, not that long ago, because I just had to download the earring tape, and I wanted to get the final version so bad. But earrings, uh, like I bought yeah. this CD copy a while ago, but I need a vinyl copy as well. So I cool. will be purchasing myself a vinyl copy as well because it's a must-have. Really, it is. Yeah. It, it's just, I don't know, there's something about the cover on, like, this big, when you just get to look at it. Because this is something that I really will do when I listen to this. I just sit here and I just look at the cover. And it hits you emotionally. Yeah, I agree. That's why I need it. Here, stop bothering me. Music, melody, everything. It hits you that much harder. Yeah. And another sense of irony here is that, well, we, well, I didn't, but so many people thought that we were all going to die yesterday. Yeah. yeah. And here we are, you know, still talking. But the idea that this is like a one year anniversary of his death and that so many people are thankful to be alive today because, you know, you know, never thought about that. Foreshadowed events did not actually happen, yeah. but I know a lot of people are very thankful for their lives, and knowing that this is the one-year anniversary of of, um, of a man who wrote lyrics saying, you know, you know how to value of life, and it just, yeah. just adds to the creepiness yeah. of it again. It's oddly enough, an album, like when I'm really sad or depressed about something, 
I put this one on and I somehow feel better. I may end up feeling the emotions a little bit harder at points, especially in the more depressing moments such as like finality. Um, but in the end you feel better somehow. Yeah. And I have a feeling that's what David felt when he played this music. When he wrote it and recorded it and everything. Mm -hmm. And it's just a sense of relief. It, it is. Yeah. And just to talk about the, the emotions again from listening uh, to this album, there are certain albums that when you hear a song for the first time, it'll hit you, and it, sometimes it might hit you again on a second or third listen. But then, on average, the emotions just start to kind of die off, and then you'll hear the song again. It's just like you already know what to expect. You just kind of go through the motions. But on this one, you hear it again, and you still feel just as moved as the first time you hear it. Sometimes even more moved. Sometimes even more. It's not something that just fades away with time. Because it's not just a collection of the same idea, it's a saga. And that's the way it was intended to be written. But when I hear... You know, I might not be as chill to the bone, you know, when I hear Lightning and Snow now, uh, as the first time I heard it, but, uh, you know... It's still, you know, really chilling every single time I hear that. This is that won't go away. I almost, I almost feel like if I sit, if I sit and listen to the whole thing, once it's done, I'm almost exhausted because I've gone through that emotional roller coaster, and it's just sort of like once it's done, like the first time I listened to it, I just sat there, just in awe, completely silent, nothing going through my mind. I was just like. <laughs> and every time, I, that's that's one of the reasons why it makes me feel, you know, a little bit better. Like, uh, I went through a, a hugely stressful period, and uh, there was a few albums. This one was was one of one of the ones that I was listening to a lot during that time. And uh, afterwards, I would feel better. I would feel like relief, and I would just feel exhausted enough to just be at peace for a little while. And uh, I think that's, that that might be why it had such a big impact on me again, just because of that whole just emotional everythingness going on within the entire fucking album. Yeah, it is comforting feeling almost. We're having to leave early. But, uh, All right. I, I got a girlfriend now. I think she's far away, and it's fucking icy. So I want to go before oh. it gets really bad. All right. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, thanks um, for stopping in. And yes, many thanks. I learned a lot about what goes on in these things, and uh, hopefully the nervousness will go away if you ever let me back. I don't know. Yeah. Might happen, might not. Yeah, but, uh, absolutely. Thanks. And uh, it was really cool listening to all your guys' opinions on the album and, mm -hmm. and on the band and, band and everything. So uh, that was nice, and uh, good luck. And uh, hopefully, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll watch the rest of it, I guess, when, yeah. you, when you upload it next time. But, uh, yeah. Anyway. Have a have a good night, guys, and thank you very much. All right, see you later. Thank you, dude. Thank you for joining us. Bye bye. Thanks for joining. So, all right, now we well, yeah we're back on air. I'm checking the YouTube page. All right. Yep. I wish I knew what that was and why that keeps happening, but you guys, we're so sorry about that. I don't, yeah, I don't yeah. even know what's happening. But either way, let's continue with what we were discussing. Disgusting. And I hope this does not happen again. <sighs> okay. So, remember what we were talking about? I can't remember the exact thing. Hmm. We were saying, uh, I know we were talking about the emotions of the album. No, okay, what, do you, what do you yeah, think is the, what do you think is the most emotional part of the record, whether it's either lyrics or the music, what do you think is literally the highest point of emotion being conveyed for, on this record? That is me, honestly for, impossible for me to decide. For <laughs> me, personally, it probably has to be Kiss My Ashes Goodbye. I think it's yeah. the block of the final three songs of Kiss My Ashes Goodbye, Finality, and Alternate Ending. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that one, too. Uh, those songs hit me the hardest. It's some of the most heart-wrenching moments on the album. Agreed. One track that hasn't really been talked a lot about this that I think was not the highest emotional point in the whole album, but 
for me it was way up there is the Trocadora Vivos. Mm. Yeah, that's a very good one. I don't know why, but something about that track, it had this feeling to it. I kind of like the, for me, what I really like about that song is actually the build-up to the verse that he does, like when he says the opening line of a moment of silence, but not one moment more, the debtor to be forgotten, we are here to be adored, and then how the transition goes into the verse. Yes, exactly. Really like the flow of it. And overall, I think that song might actually have the best flow, like transition-wise, on the whole record. Mm. And that's I think... one thing that I have to say about their songs is, especially on this album, I mean, I guess maybe some of the older Woods albums had a little bit of a case of it sounding a little bit unnatural, the flow of it, so to speak. But this doesn't sound like they just went in the studio and like, all right, let's write the songs and record them, slap them together, and what happens, happens. It's kind of well thought out, and it was just kind of a 100% genuine, natural experience. And that's something that I feel like all the songs, but especially Adora Vivos, has the most. And Adora Vivos, for me, like, that was one of those tracks where, like, it was, like you said, it had amazing flow to it, which I do agree with, but this thing was sort of like, not the quintessential, but one of the quintessential tracks of the album, because it felt like he was striking out, not really in anger, but in disbelief against... Um, the modern society as it was. And anyway, that's the way I interpret it. Because of the way that the line comes up, especially when he screams the line, in the bleak life and modern times, under gray skies and electric light. Like, that for me was the point where this album just sort of really hit me as, wow, this is amazing. Um, like, I was loving the hell out of it, but right then, that's when it just sort of clicked with me. Okay, this is going to be like one of my favorite albums. I'm going to start the church of Woods 5 if I have to, because <laughs> just unreal. Yeah, um, I have to agree with you on that being very hitting, especially that line. That, it's funny you mention it, because I wanted to bring that up. And just the thing. way in which he screams it, it has this um, not... I, I don't know, I can't think of the adjective to describe it, but it sounds like you know, he's lashing out at something, but at the same time he's not. Thing about this album is how he actually used in the bleak life in modern times of Grey Skies and Electric Light and Under Grey Skies and Electric Light. Um, I think it's pretty interesting how he used that in Death is Not an Exit in Adore Vivos. Yeah. Effectively. Um, because I think that's a very powerful line and I really do like the fact that he used it in both songs. Because it kind of ties that series of songs together in a way. Yeah. Once again, it makes it very cohesive. Yes. And the whole album as a whole is extremely cohesive, but I think that block of songs is definitely from the most. Hmm. Well, what about you, Bolt? What's your uh, like highest peak emotionally? <clears throat> well, I think I already kind of said it. It's at the end when alternate ending comes on. Just everything about the sound of the music just like the the note choice the progression into the lyrics just painting that picture of exactly what happened and, and whatnot and then just the chorus and the, 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 I don't know everything about the, the melody and the lyrics to the chorus are just so heart-wrenching yeah you know mm -hmm. in the end was there anyone to share in your joy that's just done yeah <laughs> yeah can't can't really say much more than that. Yeah, for me, it's probably going to be different for me, but I, I think Traveling Alone is the most emotional song for me. That I'm was not quite sure why, but... Like, upon like my second, third listen, that was my favorite track. And I'd say that hit me extremely hard. Mostly it due still to is songs. my favorite track. Has been for months and still is. But the thing is with me, I cannot pick a favorite track or a favorite moment on this album. I honestly cannot, because each one is just perfect in its own way. And yeah, I don't know, like, I've stressed this enough that this is now holding the current spot for my favorite album of all time. Well, that's why. It's crazy. 
Yeah, it's definitely that climbed up pretty high on my way. list, even though it doesn't exactly have five years or so to age, but it doesn't that's I guarantee the thing about in five, this record. I guarantee in five years I'll still think the same about this album. That's the thing about this record. It already feels timeless and it's only been out for a little under a year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's already timeless to me and of course to many others with you guys included. Yeah. No, it's and when a, when an a, when an album can have that kind of impact on you and seem timeless, that's when you know that it's literally something really something special. Yeah, when yeah, did when... Eric actually release the the leak? The leak was December twenty second. Yeah, today. Oh. Last one year yeah. ago. So, so it is one year. But this didn't come out till April, I believe, this year. Right, the, the physical hard copy. Yeah. yeah, I guess there was like delays at the pressing and all this other stuff. Yeah, it was meant to come out in January, then it got pushed back to like March, and then finally, it came out in April, I believe. Because mm. I remember having to report on that for a moment of metal. Like, that's why I remember that. I really think Yuri should have uh, promoted the album a little bit more than they're putting up because I didn't know when it's out until one day I saw it and like so uh, it was when John posted a picture of it on Facebook. It's like, oh, there's physical copies now. I didn't know that. But they didn't really make any mention of it, which I thought was kind of odd. <laughs> but uh, one thing I have to say too is. I never really encountered a album that's this dark, that's this catchy. Yeah, yeah. Because on uh, most dark albums, just are like straight dark. There's no real catchiness to them. Almost every song has a melody that you're gonna remember, that you're gonna want to hear again. Like the replayability of this album is incredible, but the catchiness is just mind blowing. And that's something that I'm a sucker for, is if an album's catchy, I'm going to like it, or if a song's catchy, I'm going to like it to an extent. And they nailed it. Yeah, and not only did they make Darkness catchy, but they made it beautiful as well. Mm-hmm. And that's a very hard thing to balance. <laughs> in, in some bands' cases, at least. Like, My Dying Bride does it well, um, couple others do darkness and beauty pretty well. But typically it's either like dark and ugly or kind of light and beautiful in a lot of bands' cases. They manage to blend the two worlds perfectly. It offers something that not a lot of doom metal records can offer. There's a lot more substance to it. There's something in there that everyone will like. Even fans of black metal would like a door Vivos, like with the harsh vocals on it, or lightning and snow. Um, the blast beats in some parts. Uh, the fills, if you're a fan of like more technical stuff, the fills on some of the songs are crazy, like the drum fills. And the transitions are very smooth. There's something there for everyone. Uh, I just can't really find a reason why someone really wouldn't like it unless. Or, like turned off by his voice or something. It's true in all I recommend to pretty much any band. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I would definitely be interested in seeing how someone who's not a fan of metal music, um, how how they would react to it. Well, my dad's not really a fan of metal, and I showed it to him, and he thought it was pretty damn good. Wow. He was he got chills actually, surprisingly, from hearing uh, "Kiss My Ashes Goodbye." Wow. Uh, it's the so same, actually. I, I've actually shown my dad this album as well, and he he has felt the same way that you did, Sean. Like, a few of the songs on here just gave him chills. Yeah. It's, like, it's, it's an album which you don't... Even if you don't like metal, yeah, you can find something in here that you will like. If you like music, you will like this album. That's... <laughs> That's the best way I could possibly think to put it. Like, Woods 4, you kind of had to be into Doom, or you had to be into Black Metal. And the other albums, you had to be into, like, Atmospheric Black Metal, or just Black Metal in general, to really get it. Yeah. Uh, with this one, you can just go straight to it, and there's going to be something you're going to like and grasp onto. Not only like, but you're going to feel a lot from that. For sure. It really... 
in a way, what I like about this album too, compared to Woods 4, it's how you and me were talking before, was Woods 4 was an incredibly long album. Yeah. Yeah. And at times it felt like it went a little too long. This one, it's right to the point. It's the perfect length. If it was any shorter, I would be disappointed. If it was any longer, it would start to feel a little tiresome. Yeah. But even when the album ends, you just want to put it on again. Yeah, that's so. the great part about it. Is it has that ability to do that to you. Um, since we've talked a lot about the lyrics and like emotional part, like musically, what would you say is your favorite part of the record? Hmm. Musically, probably uh, career suicide. I love the guitar in that song, and even the solo, and just how everything is uh, constructed and structured. I absolutely love how they did that song musically. Yeah, it'd probably be for me, Lightning and Snow, Career Suicide, Kiss My Ashes Goodbye, and Alternate Ending being my favorite you know, musical parts. For me, it's Kiss My Ashes, Finality, Adora Vivos, <laughs> Lightning and Snow. He's got to name the whole album. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you could. You could. Name the whole album. Name the whole album. Yeah. For me, it would probably... Okay, I just say the whole album. Okay, I'm going to drop out of this question. <laughs> I think, for me, musically, uh, Lightning and Snow, Traveling Alone, uh, Silver, and Kiss My Ashes. Oh, yeah, Silver is another great musical one. Silver really has some awesome guitar parts. Yeah, some of my favorites is uh, Adora Vivo, Silver, uh, Finality, and Kiss My Ashes Goodbye, especially the riff that when he says, oh, hmm. save your tears at the end of our time. I love that just really doomy, heavy, rushing riff that comes in with the organ, keyboard, you know, sort of thing that they play. It fits so well, and the transitions are absolutely fantastic. Like seamless, and if your transitions are seamless, I'm gonna like your music. Because as someone who's in a band, sloppy transitions or forced transitions really, really bother me. Like cut and paste, and that song just has perfect. And even the way they did on uh, combine parts one and two of "Kiss My Ashes Goodbye," it still sounded, it sounded right. It didn't sound like they just took two songs and slapped them together on one track. Hmm. And I really appreciate that part of it. And it kind of makes me wonder if the whole album would kind of have that sort of flow to it. If they kind of put it together as one song. So I kind of think it would, because every song just really flows well into each other. There's nothing that feels out of place on it. Especially musically speaking. There's nothing that would really stick out like a sore thumb in the whole thing because the album kind of dives from these really high parts to low and then it slowly picks itself up back to the high before it crashes down into the low. With like Silver, it starts to get... It gets really depressing and then Career Suicide, it goes back to the like more higher range of the emotions you know, the more yeah. positive. And then when Modern Life Architecture comes on, it just crashes right down. So, yeah, I probably have to add "Traveling Alone" to my list of favorite songs musically. Yeah, yeah, that is literally Just the, my the progression in that song. It's not exactly like the musical finesse that any of the, you know, instruments have. It's just the the, the way it progresses and just the yeah, proper like note said, choice and just the progression of it is just very well done. Just literally the way they constructed the entire track just feels so amazing musically. Yeah. Like we said uh, uh, before, like there's nothing really flashy going on musically here. I mean, there's not, you know, huge technical riffing and crazy solo work. There is a and, point, but they're yeah. placed almost strategically. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's not, it's not like I mean, we're they, not talking about for dynamic effect pages. rather than for like uh, showy versatility. Yeah. yeah, or like I like to call it necrophagia syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> When you try to be tech for the It's not going to be at that level, but... It's just kind of like a, a lot of bands will try to 
be like, oh, we can play this, so let's do it. Like, David could have probably written more technical if he wanted. He didn't. He did what fit, and that's what I would really appreciate, too. Yeah. Not to mention, I would have loved to uh, see how they did this in a live setting. You know, I was going to bring that up, too. Is yeah. Mm. How he would have pulled that off. Because he pulled off songs off Woods 4. But now I'm in a live. From what I've seen in the videos, he, uh, they nailed it perfect. And I really wanted to hear them capture, what was the song I was listening to? Silver. Mm. Silver, I would really would have loved to heard live. Especially mm -hmm. at the end when he does, uh, when you're silver, the truth always hurts, and it is. Yeah. Yeah, when you're silver, you never come first. When you're silver, the truth always hurts. That line, the way he sang it, I would have loved to have heard how he would have pulled that off live. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. And actually, same thing for, um, Kiss My Ashes Goodbye. And a song like Career Suicide has just a upbeat, fast energy to it. Oh, yeah. That would have been great to see. Yeah, I think Career Suicide is the most like up-tempo, kind of happy-sounding track on the record. That would be a yeah, It is a very live-sounding song, though. I it agree. would be the show opener, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well even Lightning, Lightning and Snow, Snow could have been a great show opener. Yeah, Lightning and Snow could be a good opener. It's a great album opener. That would be a perfect show yeah. opener as well. Especially, like, the snare in it, like, the pop, pop in the chorus. Not the chorus, the uh, verse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a very happy-sounding thing. <laughs> like, for me, like, when I heard that drum beat, like, this sounds really... happy-sounding like, snare. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> like, that, that beat is extremely happy-sounding, but managed to make it work in the context of the album. That's, that's it. Yeah, I mean, there's just so much with this album that I just can't picture another band really even doing. There's no way anyone but David Gold and the, the everyone who recorded on this record could possibly pull this off again. There's literally no one, in my opinion, that could pull this off or execute it as well as they did here on Woods 5. Like, there's been tons of albums that have similar vibes to them. Like, once again, going back to, like, My Dying Bride. Or even the new Swallow the Sun record. Mm. It's a very somber, yes. very depressing, very serious, very almost inspiring sort of vibe to it. But it's not done in such a perfect way. Because the way the Swallow the Sun album kind of flows, in my opinion... It flows good, but if they would have changed the way the tracks were placed within the record itself, I think it would have flowed a lot better. And the way they placed the tracks, like you said, on the physical version of the album, it made it that much better. Mm. And that's something that a lot of bands really should consider is song placement. And I don't know who was in charge of the song placement after David's death. It may have been Joel, it may have been someone at the label or whatever, but whoever did it, they see this great job. Um, yeah, I mean, just everything about this is amazing. I can't think of another album that's done this to me other than, let's say, The Mantle. Agalon, that's an album that hit me about the same, but in a different way. Yeah, I really can't think of another album that's kind of hit me like Woods 5 did. The only thing that has hit me in the past seven or eight years is one of my favorite albums of all time by a band who's become one of my favorite bands ever, and that's Tesseract. That's just for me personally. Above Pretty the much besides world, that, for me. Aside from that, I mean, there's literally... There's only been three or four records really my entire life that have hit me the way that these have, and Woods 5 is one of them. Like, there's been some that impacted me, like, uh, one that came out this year, actually, Ahab the Giant, that one just absolutely crushed me. Oh, oh my, that was amazing. 
Yeah, it's it's a perfect album, but it's perfect in a different way. Yeah. Uh, I think it's still going to be great in five years, but I still think Woods is going to hold up to the test of time longer than pretty much any album that came out this year. Yeah, this one definitely you know, skip the test of time rule in my book of like classifying an album as timeless or one of my favorites of all time. I can't really name an album off the top of my head that had this impact um, or, like, or the impact like this one did. I mean, I'm, I could probably think of one if I thought hard enough, but this one definitely rose to the top faster than any other album I can remember offhand did. Actually, surprisingly, this one went faster to the top of my list than the yeah. newest Trypticon album did because that one when it came out was upon one yeah. listen I was just bored and each time I listened to it more and more it became one of my favorite albums of all time and I would put it in my top five. Yeah. But I could definitely album, put this in my top twenty five favorite albums of all time. Yeah. Um, even right now, but we'll see what, what happens with time. <laughs> I have a feeling this is gonna be an album that if you're a fan of what's it eat pray you're going to show this to your kids when they get you know when you have them or whatever it's definitely going to be one of those type of albums mm -hmm. i like how my dad showed me black sabbath paranoid and master of reality i'll be showing my kid what's five it's definitely one of those type of records that mm -hmm. will never ever age yeah, this is something you want to share with as many people as possible. Yeah. And it's not exactly for, like, the happiest of reasons, but it'll definitely resonate with them. I tell people if this album doesn't resonate you, you have no emotions, and it makes me <laughs> question you as a human. <laughs> <laughs> like, you're not a human being if, like, finality or alternate ending doesn't hit you. Or even Kiss My Ashes Goodbye, or really any song on this album other than, like, uh, uh, Career Suicide. That's, like, the only one where I can see someone being like, I didn't really feel much emotion from it. The other ones, though, I can see, I don't understand how you couldn't mm -hmm. get anything from it. That is absolutely true. Another thing that's really great about this is the mix master. The mix is really good. Yeah. Because compared mm -hmm. to Woods 4, this is a giant step up. Like, Woods I would 4 would have been better if it didn't peak at certain moments and stuff like that. But this one just sounds amazing. Like, there's nothing that's overbearing in the mix. And the way that they actually layered the stuff, they mixed it so well where, like, let's say in um, Finality, when there's that vocal melody going on in the background when the violin hits, that really shows to me, like, the amazing uh, quality that the production has to it. Mm -hmm. Because if they would have turned it up too loud, it would have been too obnoxious if they had it too low in the background would have even known it existed. Yeah. They would put it at such a perfect level within the song where it really adds to the emotion to like the violin part of the piano going on with it. Yeah. Uh, and like the, the very last seconds of finality where you think that there's almost nothing happening, you turn up the volume and you still hear the piano ringing out. Yeah. This is phenomenal. And the way they layered uh, David's voice, yeah. they did it really well because it wasn't done in a uh, in a way where it seemed like they just slapped two vocal tracks together. It was just kind of a very good. I'm trying to think of the right word for it. The way they mixed both of them together, it made it sound like it was one voice and not two. Uh, that's the thing I don't like about layered vocals most of the time is it doesn't have that quality to it. It sounds like it's an obvious layer. It sounds two voices. Hmm. The way they did it, and the way David's voice was, he had a quality to his voice where even though his ranges were either baritone or actually re well, uh, uh, relatively high, 
Um, those two together sounded amazing. And that's something I really like, and even uh, uh, what was the song where you, a good example of that is uh, right when he does the woe at the beginning of uh, Save Your Tears at the End of Our Time on Kiss My Ashes Goodbye Part 1. The way they layered the vocals there, it's so good. Hmm. There, there are points on this album that's almost as if David's speaking to you directly. Yeah. So some, some parts don't actually need to be sung. They can just be spoken and still have the same impact on you. Oh, back to Kiss My Ashes Goodbye with the first verse in the song. He's not really singing it, he's just kind of speaking. The more in the end is to say goodbye not to yearn for that which we will never have again. Sounds like he's just kind of speaking that to you. And that's the quality that I like about this. It feels like a very personal album, not just to him. Also, it feels like he's talking to you. And it's something that everyone can relate to. Because at least one song I hear someone can relate to the lyrics. And once again, that's something that I don't really find in too many albums. Most people will either feel it or they won't. I can't think of one case on this album where you wouldn't be able to relate to it in one way, shape, or form. I agree with that completely. I mean, everyone has gone through like a really bad breakup or something. I like agree with that. Silver mm -hmm. will be a song that you will definitely relate to. Um, kind of like the reflection of life. Everyone thinks about like what's after death, what, in the grand scheme of things, what's going to happen after I die, and it just kind of tells you straight out, and I kind of like that factor to it. So I like about it. It's very, it's very unpretentious. Like it's not trying to make you feel anything. It's just presenting it to you. Like here it is. Take from it what you will. But it still touches everybody in a way. Yeah, it's not preachy at all. No, yeah. it's not like saying like, "Oh, look at us. We're so deep. Oh, listen to us. Read our read our lyrics. That kind of shit." Yeah, especially with his um, inclusion of the idea of religion in the storyline, if you even want to call it a storyline. But yeah. yeah, it really does feel like a story. Someone on the uh, comments says he acts. This person actually lived five minutes away from where they recorded Woods Five. Oh wow! That's awesome. If you ever have a band, go record there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they did a great job with this. I know if I would be there, I would uh, definitely record there. For sure. Let's see, what else can we talk about? Going back to uh, Woods 4 for a second, and uh, my favorite song off that, which is uh, You Are Here With Me In The Sequence Of Dreams. Um, I really like this just kind of goes to show David's songwriting ability. He was able to make that song feel like a dream. Do you know what I mean? It has that very dreamy yes. atmosphere to it. I do know what you mean. Somber sort of thing. How that ties in with this record is he's able to create whatever the atmosphere of the song is about. And not only the music, but the vocal performance and the lyrics. Like, you get the entire feel of what he's writing. It's not just like the lyrics and the music kind of have a similar atmosphere. It's the music and the lyrics and the vocals and everything about it has the perfect atmosphere for what he's trying to portray. It's when it gets dark, serious, and somber, you feel it. When it's almost like a dream like atmosphere here, like you're here with me in this sequence of dreams, you really get that. Um, I was buried in Mount Pleasant Cemetery. You kind of feel that almost death like presence in the song. Yeah, and it's the same with like the song uh, Shards of Love. 
the first yep. track on the album. Definitely. Like, he's got this feeling of, like, loss and, like, questioning why it is, and his voice and the music conveys that perfectly. It's, like, got this hopeless, I've given up, but I don't, I wish I hadn't have given up kind of vibe to it. Yeah. Like, it's a very human experience listening to his work. A lot of bands, it kind of lacks that human element. It's something everyone can relate to, and that's the beauty of it. Yeah. Okay, I have a question to bring up just upon the whole catalog for anybody who has heard it. Uh, what was your most... What's your favorite, so to speak... Not really favorite, but most comparable to you uh, track that this musician has ever put out, or this group of musicians has ever put out? Oh, man. Mm. That, that's a tough one, but... Probably Modern Life Architecture. For me, to be honest, it's not even off of this album. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. The track uh, "Your Ontario Ground," "Your Ontario Town is a Burial Ground." <laughs> That's my favorite track off the album. Well, is not that my because favorite. you're in Canada. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And because I live in piss hole nowhere. Kind of yeah. Either modern life architecture or silver. Both of those have like really silver. Those have messages I can easily relate to for sure. Silver. Yeah, Sean, silver. you've discussed yeah. that before. Yeah, silver and finality. Yeah. Uh, two that I can definitely relate to it. You're here with me in this sequence of dreams once again. Yeah, that one as well. But that one, I'd probably just have to say, you know, lightning and snow and alternate ending. Like those two bookends are just <laughs> like the most powerful things in the entire Woods discography. And the thing is, too, with Woods is, no matter what he did, the progression. Like, just in the context of this catalog, it made sense. Even if, like, if you heard Woods 5, back when Woods 1 came out, or 2, you would kind of be like, what? But the albums in between really made sense. Like, in retrospect, 3 was really pointing in the direction of 4. And as John said, 4 was the leap, and 5 was the landing. Mm, for sure. And once again, I really wish I could hear what was next for them. Because they were kind of a band that really didn't put out the same album twice. Yeah. There's always a certain element of something new being brought to the table. Now, I have a, a topic to bring up about the album that I think could be a really cool discussion. And <coughs> it's in regards to the name of it. Grey Skies and Electric Light. Now that... That line is something that appears in multiple songs on the album, you know, in multiple different settings. Now, given the the true nature of like the album lyrically, do you think that is an appropriate name for an album, or does that kind of leave it a little bit ambiguous? I think it's appropriate. I agree. When I think of I agree. electric light, I'm thinking of two different things. Um, first one is lightning, a storm. Um, and I think that's pretty fitting because of the connotation associated with storms and rain and gray skies. Kind of like, you know, dark and depressive. And also, the other thing I think of is this cover. The city. Gray skies and electric light. Living. In a way, I can almost see it as, like, uh, living in a place filled with people but feel, feeling alone, in a way. Being in a city, surrounded by all these people, surrounded with all this electric light, yet all you can see is the gray skies. Yeah. The darkness of it. Um, I think that's a great title. At first, I, I didn't really understand it too much until I really started thinking about it, and it made some sense. Mm -hmm. so I can see where someone would say it's kind of ambiguous or whatever, but... It clicked with me right from the start. It's the same way that you described it. Like, it has almost a nihilistic um, sort of sense to it with the gray skies and electric light. I, I don't know. It's just the feel of 
like everything that we have constructed has this falsehood to it. Like it had this really nihilistic sense when it first hit me. But yeah, now that you bring up that this. other point of view of it. Yeah, we built all this stuff around us and none of it is really doing any good. You know, exactly, because like the play on words of under this electric light we have only gray skies, I guess you could say. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that's a that's just a really good like the more I think about it right now, that's just a great title. Yeah. There's a lot of different meanings behind it. Yeah, that, the, I think the title is the most interpretive thing about this record because, I mean, as I said, you could interpret some of these lyrics in a different way, but a lot of them are just spelled out very clearly. But the title of the album, that's, yeah, that's where I think it stretches it a little bit further. Yeah, it's like it's one of those titles where you can just, like, there's not, like, a set meaning for it. You just have to interpret it for yourself to really determine what you think it means. What does it mean to you, I guess? Is yes. The, yeah, the true. But that's really what the whole album comes down to. It's like he brought. I don't know about that. I, I don't kind know of if do. You could say the whole album is kind of like, what does it mean to you? I kind of think a majority album is kind of spelled out in black and white, what it's about. Yeah, but like it's spelled out in black and white. Like he wrote this. This is what he was saying. It's just what you make of what he was saying. Is what I'm trying yeah, to. Yeah, I guess. Really yeah, do. I see that. Yeah. Yeah. But even, you know, the opening lines to Death is Not an Exit, the bleak life in modern times of gray skies and electric light. Electric light doesn't always have to be about lightning. It can just be about electric light, meaning, like, the modernness of society with electric, like, light bulbs and stuff yeah. like that. And who knows? It, it, the computer monitors the, that you are all watching this on. Yeah, it, it yeah. could just be, you know, about the bleakness of the modern generation and how the significance of, of a life is viewed. Yeah, well, that just made me think of something like he says he's talking about like uh, the bleak times and everything. Like, you know, it, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, it used to be like vast, you know, open landscapes of trees and everything. And everything was really vibrant and bright. Mm -hmm. But now everything we have like these cities just filled with these plain, bland, gray buildings and all that shit. And it's all you see everywhere yeah. now, and that's all you have, and it's very bleak, literally. So yeah. uh, I don't I mean I don't know. That's a stretch, but hey. Yeah, I yeah, that. And even just the album cover, I mean, there. I mean, I know it's kind of part of the logo and what they're all about, but the way that the the trees and the forests are kind of superimposed over the city yeah. cityscape. Yes, it's it's almost a way to like try to bring us back to the old ways of thinking, and it's sort of like a depressive uh, take on like how modern society doesn't exactly treat life the way that it used to, and it's almost okay. seemed like the wrong way to think about life at this point. I find the boat very interesting about the cover, speaking of which. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe you guys can help me. Do you have any idea what that's about? Yeah, well, if you also that's notice, it's, uh, it's in the CD tray. Yes. Oh, I, I don't have that. You know. It... To me, it almost looks like trying to, you know, paddle without a paddle because you, I don't see like a an oar or anything. In my opinion, it, just it almost like looks like this person lost. might be. It almost looks like this person might be like uh, trying to take water out of the boat that he's in, like yeah, it, it, like it's sinking or something. You know, in my yeah, for me, it's the almost like, like the water is coming out of like the boards under under here. Yeah. Like, for me, it's like he is just... He's floated out into... Essentially into nowhere. and He's lost his complete course of direction, so he's just sort of accepted his fate, oh, no. I guess you could say. To, uh, to, I, I was supposed to show the uh, the ending... Yeah, the uh, not the ending. The, uh, the other side of the, the cave, because there's like a yeah. man walking yeah. into yeah. like a and tree. He's got like a briefcase in his hand. Like a businessman... Kind of escaping from the modern city. Yeah, yeah the modern times, literally. And yeah, going like, back to uh, the ideals of the past, sort of. Death of a yeah. salesman, anyone? <laughs> <laughs> kind of going to, I guess you could even say, um, the way man was original, originally before mm -hmm. modern life. 
going mm-hmm. back to uh, true human nature. Yeah, for sure. It's a good way of looking at it. <laughs> but like, he's also quite slouched, and it's still got that dark motif to it. Oh, very. Especially. It's almost way. like he's that like is the. Blonde. I can see that being like the image, which was the painted version of Keeper of the Ledger. You know, that makes a lot of sense. Because, like, he's going back to nature, but it says in the song that nature doesn't care at all about you. Like, that kind of vibe to it. Yeah. That would explain the dark motif that it has. Yeah, especially, like, the ominous look of the trees and the branches. Mm -hmm. And one of them has fallen over, it looks like. That is just, like, Keeper of the Ledger to me. It, it, it actually, it, it looks like it's fallen over as soon as he walks into it. If yes, can, there's no escape. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's very symbolic. Awesome. And like, I don't know if you can see it, but there's one tree that my finger's on right now. It's kind yeah. of bright. But it looks like it's a mouth and two eyes that's just crying out. Oh, yeah. If anyone wow. else can see that. There's a couple of them. Nice. I know, like it's all over the trees. That's really yeah. wild. Symbolism. Symbolism I love everywhere in this album. Yeah, that's for sure. But yeah, um, well, it's clear that we could go on and on and on about this album. Yeah. It's just truly it's incredible. A, a perfect album. Pretty much. I may even upload a video that's just a complete 20 minute rant of me and how much I love this album. <laughs> Dude, that was pretty much my original review when I recorded one. Uh, I actually think I still have it somewhere on an SD card. Um, I did a review of this album back when Yuri put the promo out to the public. And it wasn't a review. I didn't put it up because it was just kind of a rambling. And I just felt like I shouldn't put it up for some reason. But it, because the album's so amazing, I couldn't find the words to describe it in a proper review fashion. So, I tried. The review was actually pretty good. I took it down because I, I'm not satisfied with it. I did not do that album ju- this album justice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I couldn't bring myself to review it. Yeah. I don't I don't think it would have been fair. Yeah. But this on the other hand is something much different. It's a free it's just kind of like we can talk freely about the album without having a set structure for a review setting. Right. Still kind of a review, but just more of a more natural way, I guess you could say. Yeah, a little a little more of a discussion and diving a little bit more deeper into the nature of it. Yeah. There's literally so much that you can possibly say about this record. You couldn't fit it into like 24 hours of video. <laughs> and there's so much you could possibly say about David as, Gold as a person, as a musician. As the, Luke Hammerhart told me one night when me and him were talking on Skype, he just goes, I could praise this album every day of my life for at least three hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> and you wouldn't run out of things to say. You really wouldn't. Yeah. Even now, as we're talking, like new things come to me almost every second. As yeah. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm listening to it right now, and <laughs> new things come to me every single time I listen to it. Because wow. it's both introspective and, uh, yeah. Well, I can't think of the outer word of introspective. Yeah. Outrospective. <laughs> Outrospective. <laughs> Brandon. <laughs> Brandon and Amer- me mispronouncing Couture, a, according to yeah. Duncan. It's fine. <laughs> but, well, I'm glad that this was a semi-successful evening, aside from the technical difficulties. Aside from any technical I was very happy we all got together and were able to make this possible. And, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And if you haven't heard this album to anyone that's watching this, I yes. hope we encourage you, you have to. to. You need At to. Least Give it a listen. I would say buy it. Definitely buy it. But if you're iffy, definitely give it a listen. If it wasn't, if it wasn't, if it wasn't for any of these guys, I wouldn't have had it. 
or bought it yesterday because I did. <laughs> <laughs> we yeah, influenced you well. I hope this encouraged at least one person to go out and buy it. If so, yeah. I'll be happy. Yeah. And if well, nothing more, the main point of all of this is to just, you know, glorify, you know, Woods and glorify David legacy. Gold without really trying to glorify. I mean, we're just speaking the truth, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah, we're not sitting here trying to lie to you about how amazing it is. We're literally speaking our minds and speaking the truth about it. Yeah, this is how I genuinely feel about it. It's an absolute masterpiece that anybody who is a fan of music in general should listen to. Yeah. And this you is will one find something to take away from it. It's an emotional powerhouse that everybody needs to at least try, I believe. This is one of those albums that when I'm 40 years old or 50 years old, I'm going to look back on and just think of how incredible it was and to think that you know I was alive when it was released. Yeah. And to have experienced it during the time it was released, it was definitely a special feeling. Mm -hmm. And it, you'll always remember the emotions for the first time you heard it, especially in context of David's passing. Yeah. It's always going to have that sort of impact on you, especially since when Yuri put it out was the day of or the day after. I can't remember which. Um, so that's going to do it for this very special tribute. I think it goes without saying that David Gold, you will be massively missed by all of us, and you know, what yeah. more can be said? <laughs> yeah. What an amazing album we are left with to enjoy for forever. Do you do you have any closing words, gentlemen? Uh, if you want to be thrown to the ground. <laughs> Brought to the heavens, and then explore every little area in between. You have to listen to this album. Agreed. Uh, pretty much all I have to say is thank you to David Gold for giving us such an amazing album as this. Thank you for sharing your gift with the world, no matter how much it wore you down throughout your life for all the sacrifices you made during your life to get to the point so we could hear this. And thank you to surviving members of Woods Eat and Pray and David's family for this. <laughs> Absolutely. That's all, all I got. All I gotta say is thank you, David Gold, for putting out a fantastic record before you sadly passed away. You were gone too soon. And... You left us with a one hell of a record that I will continue to enjoy throughout the years. So, to put it simply, this is one of the greatest records I have heard during my short lifetime of 20 years. This is one of those records that just touched me emotionally in a way that only very few have, and it's incredible.